Hi class, so tonight we are going to continue our lecture on personality development by looking at the humanists, specifically Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. And uh, so basically when we get to the humanists, we, we note a few differences and uh, how they present ideas on growth and development. Mainly we see that with the humanist, we don't have those chronological uh, stages that we see with a lot of the other theorists uh, we have talked about in class, like Erickson and Freud specifically. And uh, so really what we see is I think that the way that Mas or, or just uh, the humanists in general fit into our ideas of growth and development is that when we get to the wave of humanistic theory and psychology, we're not really as focused on abnormal behavior as we more were more so with uh, the past. Instead, what we see is more ideas of what constitutes healthy development. And so uh, because because of that, like I said, we don't see stages, but what we do see with the humanists is this idea of a hierarchy of needs. And basically, these needs are just things that we have to have in life in order to survive, and uh, they're crucial to our happiness and optimum well-being. And that really is the main point of the humanist psychologist, is they're looking at whole in, uh, or the individual from a holistic perspective, and really focusing on, you know, once again, these positive sides of human behavior and how we can go about, you know, helping people reach these optimal levels of happiness and well-being, okay? <clears throat> And so, uh, so like I said, these needs are kind of things that we need to sur to survive in life, and they very much relate to our socio emotional, cognitive, and physical development. And so, uh, the humanist, uh, especially Maslow, he felt that in order for people to really grow and develop into their true potential, into in, into being the the bestest version of themselves that they can be, or or a self actualizing as Maslow put it he really thought it came down to motivation and so uh, he really thought that uh, as human beings that we all have kind of this inner uh, kind of inner operating conditioning uh, set of motivations there that kind of relate to you know to the systems of rewards and punishments in our own minds and and uh, we see a little bit of Freud's influence there because really you know these unconscious desires these are kind of the things Things and goals uh, are well. The things that we want to achieve in life, the goals that we place for ourselves, and uh, so motivating us to, to you know reach those goals, to ascertain those needs is of key importance. <clears throat> And so, uh, when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let me move my camera here so we can see that. Oh, oops, hold on, guys. I actually uh, will real quickly I'll uh, note this top one so you guys can see it and I'm going to put my camera out of the way. So uh, basically uh, Maslow when he first created this uh, hierarchy of needs it was uh, based on uh, these five so kind of kind of simple categories and um, and since Maslow came up with this, we have actually expanded uh, some of these uh, stages in the hierarchy because really the whole point of self-actualization is that even when you reach that tip of the of the uh, pyramid there, it's not like you're done developing or done learning and growing. And so we've kind of expanded that, as you see with this top one there, to kind of... Um, and to kind of accentuate that idea more and just kind of show that, uh, you know, that some of these needs, we can kind of break them down into smaller steps so they don't seem kind of as overwhelming as when Maslow first presented this information. So that's just the difference in the two hierarchies that I have listed here. And uh, most of the time for most of the classes, I just kind of uh, stick with the basic one here at the bottom.
<clears throat> All right, so uh, basically this hierarchy of needs is set up to where we have to fulfill our most basic kind of biological self-sustaining needs, and then from there we just kind of build up. And so uh, the first stage there we see are our psychological needs, and those are just basic things. Food, water, things like uh, homeostasis, just, you know, having the ability for our bodies to be able to function, especially those automatic nervous system functionings that, you know, the ones that we're not aware of and uh, that keep us alive and that our brain kind of, our brain and our central nervous system does for us so that and we can use our brain power to focus on other things in life. So that's kind of a, a, a cool, great thing that our bodies do for us. And so, uh, you know, we have to have that. We have to be alive and be able to maintain our uh, aliveness. And, uh, and then from there, we see we then move up the hierarchy. So once we have that, we get then our shelter. And uh, usually going along with our shelter, you know, our security, our safety net. This is when we start seeing things like uh, we get jobs. You know, and, and uh, maybe we get jobs, we get cars, educations, just anything, or, or move into certain neighborhoods, move to certain areas, you know, just all those things that relate to safety and us having a place that we can call our own so that, you know, we can then focus on these other needs that and goals that we need to fulfill in life. So from there, we move up to uh, love and belonging. So once you have your basic needs, food, water, shelter, from there, you know, since we're social creatures, we have to then expand uh, that out, and that's when we start socializing, and, you know, we look for those intimate relationships, and we have our families as a, a basic foundation for that, and then as we grow and develop throughout life, you know, we meet and encounter different people, and so we form bonds with some people, and maybe not so much with other people's, but, you know, overall, everybody, I think, that we meet in life plays some role in us uh, in our development and how we go about learning and growing. And so once we have kind of those love and belonging and those kind of socialization type needs, that then kind of uh, leads to our ideas of ourselves and, uh, you know, just, uh, just our confidence and self-esteem. And so when we feel safe, we have our, those uh, physiological needs met, we feel like we belong in the place that we're at. That then, you know, boosts our esteem. And, and so we have those needs met on kind of that, that mental and kind of spiritual and socio-emotional side of our mind and our psyches there. Because now we're kind of talking about personality type things. And so once we're able to accomplish all of that in life, then we move up to uh, kind of that last stage of development. And like I said, just because it's the last stage, it doesn't mean that it ends. It just means that it is a continuing process. And uh, basically, once you reach the uh, stage of self-actualization, you you have all of your needs met, you and, and uh, you're able to kind of uh, relax a little bit more in life and kind of look and view life from more of a u, uh, utilitarian perspective. So now that you have yourself taken care of, you're able to sit back and think about, well, how can I share my gifts with the rest of society so that I can help everybody else reach this uh, last stage of self-actualization there, okay? So those are the different stages, and uh, it sounds good, it sounds all perfectly laid out, but the problem is, is that life isn't all that black and white, right? We have uh, social things that uh, come up and prevent us from satisfying these needs. We have uh, environmental things that prevent us from satisfying these needs. And so because of that, Maslow noted that even though Every human being that has ever lived on this world and will ever live on this planet has the potential to self-actualize. Only about 1 to 2% of human beings ever will. And it's because of the way that uh, just our natural and social environments are set up. 
So uh, the biggest thing that hinders development, that hinders healthy personalities and just healthy behaviors and, and thoughts and belief systems is stress. And uh, so that is really the main thing that is preventing uh, most of us in society from truly self-actualizing. Uh, society creates stressors that prevent us from having these needs met. And if we're not having these basic needs, needs met, then that prevents us from being able to go into those higher stages of consciousness. In fact, you know, like that's not even going to be on the scope of our radar because we're going to be so focused on those basic survival needs. <clears throat> So think about it. Uh, well, first think about this. Uh, you guys, if you guys remember back to our video on Freud and psychoanalysis, that Freud had the theory that uh, neuroses existed in societies because overall societies were set up to be neurotic, and so uh, you know that's then what causes the stress. That then what causes people, you know, to to allow that stress to. Uh, Oh, what's that? Oh, oh, to influence them to the point that, you know, we start getting into those abnormal behaviors and those kind of uh, mental disorders. Things like, um, depression and, uh, anxiety are really the main problems. Just a minute, guys. Let me pause this. Oh, wait. Never mind. All right, and so uh, they just prevent us, sorry about that, from actually, uh, you know, obtaining that level of self-actualization. So think about it. If you are homeless, you're jobless, and, you know, you're living on the streets, the only thing that you're concerned about at that point in your life is those basic needs. You want to make sure you have a safe place to sleep. You want to make sure that you have food, and you want to make sure that you have water. You know, you're so consumed with thinking about having those basic basic needs met that, you know, you can't really get to that point of having that uh, utilitarian perspective. And so, uh, that is basically what we are talking about here. Oh, and then uh, let me uh, uh, point this out too. And uh, also, uh, even though this is set up as a hierarchy, once again, like I said, it's not really, you know, it's not set in stone. It doesn't mean that when you get to a level, you automatically move to a next level. It's not static, I guess, is what or fixed is what I'm trying to say. It, it's shaped as a hierarchy, but it's kind of really like a fluctuating, kind of circulating, spiraling type stages there. Because, you know, Life, prevent, life experiences and, and, and environments in life uh, present us with opportunities as well as challenges. And sometimes those challenges in life can cause us to kind of sl uh, slide back down the hierarchy here. And, uh, you know, that's okay, I think. I think, because uh, just like I said, life prevents us with challenges, and I really think that it's in those challenges is where we learn and grow the most. All right, so uh, so that is all the uh, hierarchy of needs explained. And so now what I want to do is go through and talk about these ideas of self-actualization. So uh, like I said, um, basically self-actualization is just uh, realizing our ultimate potential in life. And like I said, the uh, Maslow, the humanists, they look at more of those positive sides of human behavior instead of looking at more of those uh, psychopathologies there. And so we, and so uh, humanists, they're really interested in looking at human potential, how we view it uh, inside ourselves, and uh, how we view it in context to the rest of society, and pretty much just uh, the roles that society plays in that development there. So we see, um, we, we can really see both the influences of Freud and Erickson and Maslow. Maslow's thinking here. Because we see, and we kind of have those inner unconscious things that we have to work on in our personalities and our behaviors that uh, Freud notes a lot in his psychosexual uh, d stages of development. And then we also see where Erickson, you know, it took Freud's ideas and expanded that out to include things like uh, development and context of like social situations. And so we see Maslow kind of 
a combining and, and the humanist in general just kind of combining those ideas too <clears throat> And so, once we finally uh, are able to uh, satisfy our needs and we're able to get to a point in our life to where we can uh, really focus on our potential, and that's something that we do, you know, just in life by uh, working on our education, that's all steps we take to uh, realizing our true potential and reaching those stages of self-actualization. So, it's a process that never stops in life. And like I said, it's kind of a circular, fluctuating process. And uh, that brings up a good point about Plotkin and uh, his stages of development. You can really see with his how he takes the humanist and Erickson and uh, Freud and then creates that little circular uh, stages of development that he has that I really want you guys to focus on for the final. And so uh, let's just talk about a little bit about these ideas of self-actualization now. So uh, basically with self-actualization, it's, it's kind of like I said, you find this deeper meaning and, and importance to life, kind of more of this kind of utilitarian perspective to where, you know, you're able to step back and take a look at the greater good. And uh, it's once again, you know, because we're all unique individuals, our motivation of how we go about doing that is going to change. And so, you know, we see people self-actualizing in many different ways. Sometimes, you know, it can be through art, it can be through sports, it can be through uh, work, it can be through education. And it basically relates to what are our strong points in life? What are those gifts that we have in society? And how do we best utilize those gifts? You know, supposedly self-actualized people, you know, they, they've kind of have a better idea on how to use their gifts in society. And so because of that, I would say that self-actualizing does come with age and experience. And it probably is something that once we hit middle adulthood, we're actually able to to actually achieve and start getting into uh, that stage there and then I think that's something that we spend some time on in later adulthood too <clears throat> And so, uh, for this idea of self-actualization, the way that Maslow went about um, um, uh, developing these ideas for self-actualization, he had this uh, concept of peak experiences. And really what peak experiences are, it's just kind of those little things in life that, that just make you enjoy the simplicity of life. It gives you, you know, just those feelings of euphoria, joy, wonder, something like uh, the sunset, a full moon, you know, seeing your child laugh, seeing animals born, seeing a baby born. It's just, you know, those really just kind of stop and smell the, the roses type moments in life. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how when you know you have uh, those basic needs met is when we're able to take the time to be more mindful of everything else around us. And so we can see how a society kind of creates a lot of obstacles to, uh, to uh, us being able to achieve that. But once again, it is possible for each of us to uh, achieve these uh, characteristics and these stages of self-actualization. <clears throat> And so uh, my last little point there was the idea of we have to be the master maker. So that's really, you know, the idea of self-actualization. It's not about perfection. It's just about, you know, simply working on ourselves and realizing that we're all works in process and that that, that development is a continuous a thing that, that never ends until, you know, Death. Death is the final stage of development, and that's when our development ends in this life. And then we go on or not. That just depends on uh, what everybody believes. So, uh, so it's important to note: self-actualization does not mean perfection. And so, on the last slide, my last point was uh, this idea that we have to be the master maker. So, basically, the master maker is somebody who has taken his gifts, his skill in society, and he has he has put the the education and the experience in to shape that gift into something that that is beautiful and that is presentable to society and so what the master maker learns is that in perfecting and shaping his craft and shaking shaping his gift he realizes that he is never done because you know when you create a work of art 
in, in whatever context you you would uh, you know consider that what that creation to be it there's always room for improvement and so that's something that the master maker realizes uh, if you look at uh, Plotkin's stages of development. I, I believe it's the sage. Uh, that's a pretty common archetype for uh, kind of uh, the the individual and in societies or uh, uh, that represent kind of wisdom and experience. There. <clears throat> All right, so most interestingly is that Maslow came up with these ideas of self-actualization, and I have the time, uh, the, the date there is 1970, but I believe he first published his paper on the hierarchy of needs in 1940. I swear he did, he did something in 1954. So we'll just say between the 50s and 60s, and, and that's kind of a good time period for the humanist too that's that's probably that that is about when that wave of psycho uh, that wave entered psychology too so interestingly so we came up with these ideas of self-actualization and characteristics that he defined as a self-actualized individual based on historical people and uh, some of those people were Abraham Lincoln Thomas Jefferson Eleanor Roosevelt James Adams William James and his name should sound familiar. That is one of the that is the father of American psychology. He was one of the biggest proponent of the second wave of psychology, functionalism. He actually uh, William James is one of my favorite psychologists. I I, uh, I I talk about him a little bit more in general psychology when we go into the ideas of consciousness because uh, he had uh, really has a lot of contributions in what we think of consciousness and uh, interesting guy just all around. And then we also see people like Huxley. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He has the um, he has the one great war uh, book. It's called A Brave New World, and it's kind of all about this futuristic society where they kind of like genetically manufacture humans, and, and the way they go about doing it is is pretty much they're like setting people up into classes, so the people with the best genes are at the top of society, and they get everything, while the people who are less desired are kind of at the, the bottom of society, and they're kind of like all deformed and, and just uh, no eat have no emotions and then the separate from that there's like a, a planet of kind of humans and, and they're kind of like primitive savage type humans kind of it's kind of like they're back in Neanderthal kind of prehistoric days running around and and so yeah just a really interesting social commentary there if you've never read Huxley and uh, he also I think he might have did the uh, uh, a book called The Invisible Man too, not the Stevenson Invisible Man, but uh, another one there. And then we also have people like Spinoza, and Spinoza is a famous uh, kind of ancient, philo not ancient, but a famous philosopher. And then uh, of course we see people like Albert Einstein, and I would believe now, I mean, I would add people like Muhammad Gandhi. Um, uh, oh gosh, I, I can't think of his name, Nelson uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, people like Jane Goodall, there's a, a great psych uh, psychologist who is, uh, I believe, she is in her 90s now, and she is still out just kicking it and, and working as hard as ever. Her name is Joanna Macy. She's a She's really, she's a really great one if you ever uh, are born and want to look up a famous psychologist. She's a really good one to go look at. She's kind of more into eco psychology, transpersonal psychology there. But uh, anyway, I would I would include those type of people too because I see the characteristics. I'm going to show you guys in a minute it emulated in the way those people lived and and still live their life because of course Jane Goodall and Joanna Macy are still alive there. And then I would challenge. A couple of these that he's talking about. I guess specifically, specifically, I'm thinking about Thomas Jefferson. When you think of, you know, Thomas Jefferson did some great things, but then when it comes to his kind of attitudes and behavior when it came to things like slavery and racism, I, I would have to question if I would consider those to be factors in self-actualization, and I'd say they're not, and I think that maybe Maslow just kind of ignored 
those parts of Jefferson's life. I mean, I don't know. I'm speculating, but I would think he would have had to to include him on this list. And so, uh, anyway, my little two cents there of how I disagree with uh, that one choice there. <laughs> and uh, there is just a link there if you guys want to go and uh, look a little bit more into some of these ideas. I got a link there for you. Okay, so in order to be self-actualized, before we start getting into looking at those characteristics, Maslow had a list of behaviors that he felt um, helped one uh, be more likely or, or to progress a little easy, e easier or easily to that stage of self-actualization. And so uh, basically and people who experience life kind of like a child and, and kind of like a child in the innocence of viewing everything in life as fresh and a new experience for you to kind of go out and tackle um, self-actualized or, you know, behaviors that lead to self-actualization or people, they don't stay stuck in comfort zones, they don't stay stuck in dogmatic ideology you know they're not they're, they're kind of adventurous people in many ways uh, if we were to look at Jung's archetypes we could say that uh, they are the fools there's that saying that uh, fools go in where angels de uh, dare to tread or something like that it's like the fools will jump in but even the angels won't go in some situations and it's just noting that idea of experiencing everything in life as just being new and wondrous and, and you know not really calculating out all the consequences and risk at time because you know because you're still experiencing and so in many ways the fool is not a fool because he's stupid he's a fool just because he's kind of innocent and doesn't have those life experience yet and then um, a lot of behavior uh, another aspect of a behavior that uh, leads to self-actualization is that self-actualized people they're a little bit more intuitive um, you know that they're, they're a little bit more with going on their gut instincts and listening to their vo their kind of voice of consciousness inside of them instead of really going um, uh, you know with just accepting what society says because it's society and and it's supposed rules and so a good way to think about that has to do with uh, Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation I know that's exactly I think why um, Maslow picked him and, and he's like the number one people we note as self-actualized because you know by freeing the slaves like Lincoln did he did you know he was taking this utilitarian perspective and realizing that uh, if we want life to be good if we want our society our American culture to be good we really did have to step back and make sure Sure that all members of, of, of this culture will treat it in fair ways because that's kind of the uh, the whole point of the article of declarations in our Constitution you know the right for every man woman and child you know to life liberty death happiness you know that what it says in there so anyway uh, so, uh, so it's not so much as like just deviant behavior just to kind of like cause destruction in society. It's more of that deviant type of, of behavior that leads to positive things. So that's why I would include people like Mandela and Gandhi. Oh, the Dalai Lama too. He's another good one. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, it's because of their work and uh, ending segregation and uh, just what they did with the civil rights movement too. And so, um, to be, you know, to be more on that path to self-actualization, honesty is key. And honesty is the key to everything in life. If we just, you know, with all this, this talk about fake news nowadays, it's, it's really hard for us to really discern what is real and honest and, and what is not or just even why you know there would even be that question anyway you know as human beings we're social creatures that need each other to get along and we can't get along with each other when we're always being dishonest and having these uh, pretenses and uh who knows why people decide to play games that they do, but, you know, it, uh, in life, it, the best thing to do is to always, you know, once again, go with your own voice of consciousness and be the best person and most honest person you can be inside your hell, yourself, regardless of everybody else, you know. We all have the opportunity to set that positive example for others, and it works better in life if we try to set that positive example and kind of build others up rather than letting them tear us down.
And so uh, then uh, that next point there, number five, kind of goes back to what to, to goes along with exactly what I'm talking about with these ideas of deviant behavior and listening to the voice of consciousness there. And a good thing, uh, and, and so a good point then to add is this idea of being honest and not having pretenses is that uh, people who are self-actualized, they're willing to take responsibility and accountability for their actions and they work hard to achieve what they want in life. I do believe that the natural law of, of the universe and of life is just good things. We're not put on this earth or, uh, you know, in this life just to be screwed over, no matter how much life challenges us or throws stresses at us. Like I said, you know, I just think it's part of the learning and growing process. And overall, that process is for good, positive, productive things to happen. That's like the number one natural law of the universe. So that's why, you know, our power of uh, thought really plays a role in how we go about living and shaping our lives. So, you know, if you always think negatively, the universe is going to give you back negativity. When you can try to focus more on those positive and productive things, the universe will naturally gravitate those things in your life. And you can't get that by just sitting on your couch. You know, you have to put the hard work in and you have to be willing to take responsibility and accountability for your actions, even if nobody else is doing it in society. <clears throat> And then going along with that, it's okay to admit when you're wrong. So that's kind of what the, that last part is kind of about, too. It's like, you know, not everybody's perfect. Not everybody's always right in uh, what we think and believe and how we behave. And that's okay. You know, we're all here to learn and grow together. And, uh, you know, we have to be willing to say, I, I'm not perfect. I'm sorry. Or I was wrong. And then we have to, you know, have that courage and kindness with ourselves and with others to not give up in life be like well it's okay that I'm not perfect but you know I can still keep working to you know try to do better all right so those are our behaviors that lead to self-actualization and so now we have our 15 characteristics here and you see that basically a lot of these correlate with uh, those behaviors leading up to the, to the actual self-actualized stage And so, um, we see once you have reached self-actualization, a good point there is that uh, we see that things in life are not perfect, that things don't always go perfectly, don't always go to our, our perceptions our expectations and that's okay self-actualized people they're 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 able to be flexible able to adapt able to uh, flex execute like i like to say to where you know if things don't go right they can think on their feet and they can you know change that situation and then just in that you know and in doing that they accept you know they're not perfect and nobody else is is perfect so you have to work on it and uh, so they're very problem centered so what we see with self actualized people is they're not they're not very egocentric and uh, they have a spontaneity and thought and action that goes along with those ideas of being able to uh, uh, flex acute they can look at life objectively so you know they're really in touch with their emotions and, and they know and their emotional intelligence and so they know how to kind of you know be more objective and just not kind of go quite to that uh, emotional response that as humans we're so likely to do and once again even at that just because you're self-actualized and you've learned and you figured out a little bit more about your emotional states and your emotional intelligence it still doesn't mean that you're not going to mess up and give in and, and you know even the Dalai Lama talks about now, you know, people think that, you know, he never gets angry and, and, you know, and things like that. But he says, you know, no, I'm, I'm only human. I get angry too. You know, it's just that my, my beliefs in Buddhism allow me to handle that anger in, in a different way so that I'm not just leasing undestructive forces onto society. Because that's really what happens when we get stuck in anger. We're just really wasting our energy and it's not positive or productive for us at 
all. And so uh, we also see that self-actualized people, they're really creative. They have these peak experiences. They have that concern for uh, humanity's welfare. They're, you know, based on those peak ex uh, experiences, they can appreciate those basic life um, experiences. You know, they have those kind of democratic I uh, attitudes and ideas. Is, and they have very strong moral and ethical standards, and uh, they're also uh, people that, even though they, they, you know, take these expanded perspectives on helping others, they're still uh, very private people who kind of uh, keep to themselves for the most part. <clears throat> All right, and uh, so they're still very private people that keep to themselves for the most part, and uh, I think that's kind of important too because it kind of uh, hints on some of these ideas of mindfulness, you know, to truly give our vows to ourselves, our families, our friends, our co-workers, society in general, we have to take that time to slow down and, and to step back and reflect and be mindful. It's kind of like kind of like charging up your phone guys think of it that way you know your phone just can't always be on and you always using it you know at some point you have to give it a break you have to put it on a charger and let it recharge yourself and that's basically you know what we're talking about with a lot of these characteristics for self-actualization you know the way that we really reach that is with mindfulness and just you know taking that time to balance you know the hectic chaosness that society creates with you know a, a, a more um, relaxed and kind of uh, simplified life to where we have time for reflection and uh, you know so that's why these ideas of being able to take time out in nature or to you know find a mindfulness based practice that works for you are good ones because uh, they're good positive healthy things we can do for our development all right, so next we're going to look at Carl Rogers. So, uh, Carl, basically, what Carl Rogers does does is that uh, he kind of takes these ideas of self-actualization and I think he, he makes it to where it sounds a little more manageable and not so overwhelming as Maslow talks about. I mean, you know, these people I've mentioned that Maslow says are self-actualized and the ones that I'm saying are self-actualized. Some of those people have done, you know, some really extraordinary things in society that none of us, you know, not that I'm just trying to discourage anybody, but that most of us won't ever be allotted the opportunity to do. And so it just seems kind of overwhelming and it's like, you know, we're trying to feel like shoes bigger than we can fit type thing. And so I think Carl Rogers, he just kind of breaks it down a little bit more to kind of, you know, create, to, to not create kind of that anxiety that I think, you know, that, that uh, looking at all that uh, self-actualization thing it, it kind of does uh, create and in a way it can kind of uh, you know get into that obsessive compulsive type of uh, personalities and attitudes to where like you know you're so focused on self-actualizing that it can actually be detrimental to your development instead of a healthy thing if you guys know what I mean and so like I said so Carl Rogers kind of brings it back and makes it a a little bit more understandable for that other 99-98% of ourselves and uh, so basically what Carl Rogers does is that is is that he takes these ideas of Maslow and he said that you know for people to have healthy development in their life it really starts and you know or, or it really begins with the environments that people surround themselves with or put themselves in and so uh, just like Freud, just like Piaget, just like Vygotsky, you know, Rogers thought that that those uh, environments and those relationships that we uh, formed while we were in uh, those early stages of development in childhood, that those were the key foundations for how we could and would develop into healthy functioning adults. And so, in a way, you know, he kind of looked at us as like, like we're like little trees or like little flowers. And, you know, if you don't have that proper soil, you don't have that proper sunlight, you don't give it the proper wa water nutrients that it needs you know you can't ever expect that little tree or that little flower to grow into you know a healthy beautiful thing and as human beings you know we're the same way we need those basic ingredients you know to help us grow into the best versions of ourselves that we can be <clears throat> 
And so basically what Carl Rogers believed, he believed that uh, as human beings, the one basic motivation that we had was this uh, potential, this ability, or this desire, we can say, to uh, become the best human beings that we can be. Be. And, uh, you know, and so we all have the motivation to be able to do that. But because we're all unique individuals, of course, we're going to go about it in different way or achieving those uh, steps of self actualization or, uh, you know, what uh, actually Rogers calls self concept in other ways or just being the best version of ourselves that we are. So Rogers, just like all the other humanists, uh, once again, you know, he's looking more at positive aspects of uh, the mind-body connection and what it means to be human. So we thought that, you know, people innately, um, he, he's kind of more on the... <clears throat> the uh, nature side of the kind of, you know, what makes us human, nature versus nurture debate, you know, he's kind of on that tabla rosa, is that we're born these blank slates, so ultimately that does mean that we are just all good, and uh, creative too, he believed that creativity was a key part to being human, because, you know, what really is creativity, it's our ability to think of things, and to solve problems, and that is, you know, ultimately how, how we evolve, how we develop as individuals and as a society, especially as a collective. And when we look at the whole human evolution overall, you know, our, our technological innovations, those are all creative endeavors. <clears throat> and so, uh, so since Carl Rogers believed that we're all really good by nature, so we thought that is, uh, you know, <clears throat> it, it was some kind of external stimuli, external factor that kind of causes people and to slip up that packs and, and kind of, you know, reach more into those psychopathologies or maybe more uh, negative and destructive behaviors. <clears throat> And so uh, Maslow thought that, you know, one reason that uh, people would, you know, get off the path of self-actualization and turn more to those constructive behaviors, it's all because uh, it, it's really... Um, a kind of uh, uh, how we view ourselves and then how we really are in the world thing. And so this is what we see uh, by Maslow's idea of self-concept. It's how do we view ourselves and then what are the opportunities that society uh, allots us in life that, that you know allows us to become more of that person that we want to be. Be. And so um, Maslow thought that uh, once we had all those basic needs in society met, we're able to actually, uh, you know, focus on on kind of this inner development and uh, reach these stages of actualization. Uh, of actualization, these we had to have, you know, these different views of ourselves in congruence. And so uh, basically, what he thought needed to be in congruence was our idea selves, and that's who we want to be, and then our self image and our self self-image is basically how we really are. All right, and so uh, when we have our self, uh, 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 our, our idea self and our self-image in congruence, this is when we become a fully functioning uh, individual, and basically a fully functioning individual is a self-actualized individual, but much like everything else in psychology, everybody Everybody has their own little individual thing to contribute, and in doing that, they come up with their own terminology and, and their own ideas. And so, uh, we just got to remember that, uh, you know, we're talking about the humanistic uh, psychologist overall. So, so the main points are, you know, that um, people need unconditional love. People have the potential to be the best versions of themselves. People are ultimately good by nature. I mean, these are the things that we're really talking about. And then the main thing with uh, Rogers there was the idea of, uh, like I said, childhood experiences and environments are what really helped us to become, uh, you know, a, a lot to move along that path of self-actualization. And so, basically. <clears throat> so basically, this idea of a fully functioning person is, uh, you know, it, it comes when you have all these, uh, when you have your goals and your needs met, and then you're able to focus on, you know, uh, taking those gifts you have on society and kind of uh, working them more. And, um, 
they thought that uh, basically, you know, we don't reach that fully functioning stage because of, you know, like I've said, just environmental stressors or things that come up in life that challenge us and, uh, you know, we're not able to move up those stages. However, the good thing about that is that because life is a continuous journey, you know, just because, say, we get stuck on a stage or maybe we even move backwards a stage, we always have that opportunity, you know, to keep moving forward or to keep, you know, spiraling back around, however you want to fully view that. And so, uh, so it's important that we have these positive, health, healthy uh, environments in childhood that we, you know, is basically what we have discussed all a semester in class. And, and when we're able to have those things, that is then when uh, we start developing these characteristics that helps put us on that fully functioning slash self-actualized path. And so... Uh, Five characteristics here are open to experience, existential living, trust feelings, creativity, and fulfilled life. And so a fully functioning individual is, you know, it, just like with self-actualized, they're very open to uh, experiences in life. They're very accepting of their selves and accepting of others, realizing, you know, everybody is a work in progress. And I talk a lot about these ideas of positive thoughts and, and being positive in production and when uh, and productive in society and being that positive agent of social change. And, you know, when I say that, that, that really is, you know, the best way to live in life. But that doesn't mean that we uh, just deny negative things and negative emotions in life. It's kind of a, you know, you have to kind of take more of that objective perspective to life and realize that. Once again, since nobody is perfect, you know, there are going to be negative things that happen in life. And you just have to keep working on learning to deal with those and making those experiences and those emotions and thoughts kind of less in your life. And then uh, with existential living, I'm so sorry, I don't I got all my windows open. I guess I got pollen making my nose itch. So existential living, it's just, uh, you know, they're able to view life objective, objectively, you know, they don't have a lot of uh, prejudice, pretenses, or uh, just preconceptions about things in life, you know, they, they can experience differences in life, they're kind of a more, they're, they're uh, those flexicutable skills that I've talked about. They, uh, once again, you know, they listen more to their gut instinct and their little voice of consciousness. You know, they are, uh, once again, these are the risk takers, the creative thinkers. And then uh, a characteristic of a fully functioning individual is somebody who just has a fulfilled life. So ultimately, they're happy and satisfied with life, and they're just always looking for new ways to uh, learn and grow. <clears throat> And so, um, once somebody is able to become fully functioning, we see they're well-dressed and well-balanced. And uh, according to Rogers, these are interesting people to know. And we see that a lot of times they're high achievers in society. Interestingly, though, I'm not sure of who whom Rogers identified as fully functioning people. That'd be something interesting to look at. And so, uh, to be able to, you know, to have this, uh, to be self-actualized, to be fully functioning, you know, once again, we go back to this idea of self-concept, and it's just, you know, marrying together that, I, that uh, you know, that those ways that we view ourselves inside our head, and how we want to be in life, and then the way that we actually are in life, and kind of, you know, the, the opportunities and the challenges that society puts for us in life. So we want to be able to, you know, once again, bring those two perspectives into balance. <clears throat> And so we just see, uh, you know, bring it into balance or bring it into congruence. And so we just see kind of with the rest of the slide, just, just kind of talk about some different ideas of what we define as the self. All right, and so from the uh, humanistic approach, we see that there are three components that actually make up ourself. This is, you know, kind of our true identity, who we really are on the inside. Uh, I guess for it, it's more of our, our uh, these are more reflective of our psyche and kind of more of those unconscious uh, behaviors. 
in our unconscious and so we see that those three components are self or our self-worth or you know that's how we think of ourselves and others our self-image how we see ourselves and you know that's really important to having a healthy development and just a healthy view of, of self in general you know we always want to see ourselves as a, just simply as we are you know good bad ugly beautiful it doesn't matter you know we have to embrace ourselves as the whole individuals and accept our sides of ourself <clears throat> Because uh, our self-image, that really is what has the most effect on how people really go about, you know, just living and engaging in the world. And then we all have this, uh, the, uh, the ideal self, and that's always the person that we want to be. And uh, as we go through life and go through our stages of development, our ideal self will always change. And it just, you know, once again, it depends on our experiences in life. It depends on our goals, you know, whether we accomplish those goals or not. And, you know, life sometimes has a way of we set out with a specific set of goals that we think we're going to achieve and then we go through life and realize that it didn't work out that way yet you know and maybe you get a little down because of that but then you know life has this funny way of giving you other opportunities that you hadn't thought about and so you know you're able to change your goals and ambitions in life and just kind of you know once again just keep going forward all right, so once again, since uh, those childhood environments are really crucial into, uh, you know, our self concept, um, Carl Rogers believed that in early child development, we needed positive regard and a healthy sense of self worth. And so, uh, just both of those things just lead to, you know, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about in life. And so, when we have high self-worth, we see we're able to, you know, tune in to more of those positive energies in life and have more confidence and, and to keep moving forward. But we see when we have those low self-worth that, you know, we can kind of, life can be a little bit more difficult because we're a little more fixed and, and, and rigid in how we go about living our lives. And so, so, you know, it's important for, you know, those people to uh, change their ideas of self-worth. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, in, in, in creating that self-worth, it comes down to these ideas of positive regard. And, uh, you know, in order to have confidence and, and be able to tune more into the positivity in life, we have to have that positive regard you know we have to be able to feel valued respected and have affection and love in our life you know because that's what creates good social interaction and social bonds And so in looking at this idea of positive regard we have to break it up into two types unconditional and conditional and uh, and basically what we see is, you know, when you have that unconditional positive regard, this is the one that, you know, no matter what happens in life, no matter what you do, you know, there there are people, your mate, your parents, you know, mate and, and family uh, specifically, that love you no matter what because, you know, we all realize that sometimes things go wrong, sometimes people make mistakes, and, uh, you know, when you have that unconditional positive regard, Roger thought that people were more likely to, uh, you know, to have better self-concepts of, uh, of themselves, huh? To have those better self concepts and kind of be more positive and productive individuals. Whereas with anything in life, when we once we put a condition on it, then you know it's kind of uh, we've put a condition on it. We have, we have stopped that kind of learning and growing process because we say, okay, this is it. This is all you're going to get. You know, no matter what you do, you've reached your kind of glass ceiling of positive regard. And we could see how just in that idea alone how that can relate to kind of you know unhealthy self-concepts unhealthy ideas of self-esteem and self-worth and then that can kind of lead to a uh, psychopathologies too <clears throat> All right, so now we just kind of see uh, just a little chart here and a little bit uh, ex more expand uh, ex expansion on um, these ideas of congruency and 
and so basically we what we see here is that you know it's that healthy balance there when we have a uh, you know kind of that that balanced overlap of that idea self and the idea self image is when we're able you know to be able to reach those stages of self actualization and be that uh, fully functioning in individual and uh, what we see with congruencies too is that uh, you know it's once again it's something that uh, develops throughout life and it's something that's going to fluctuate depending on where we're at in life you know sometimes we'll have a good you know we'll have that congruency and it'll be good and then maybe it'll go down and you know the good thing about it is that uh, even if we do have that congruent and something happens in life that kind of unbalances those two we can always work to bring that congruency back together again <clears throat> and so uh just uh, to wrap it up here um, you know so so when we see that we're you know so we're all working on on uh, on uh, balancing out those two different versions of ourselves and, and getting through that congruency and we see a lot of time those uh, you know the reasons that we would get into states of incongruency is uh, you know it's, it has to do with how we view ourselves how we do the rest of the world and and uh, just you know find finding ways to mediate between those two so you know life's not always going to go our way and we have to learn and you know when we have that healthy state of congruence is when we're able to to realize that and not stay stuck down in those negative kind of you know negative emotions and 